Welcome to the Pelican Pod, a podcast showcasing our talented authors and illustrators and the books they create. We'll be exploring the moments in history that have inspired our books and the culture that makes them unique. This is Antoinette D'Alteris, PR and Marketing Director, and your host for this series. On this week's episode, we'll be talking with Big Chief Juan Pardo of the Golden Comanches about his new children's book, When the Morning Comes, a Mardi Gras Indian Story. We'll also hear from Marty Claus, founder of Skins and Bones, about the Bones Gang traditions and her group's contributions to New Orleans. Welcome back to the Pelican Pod. We are here with our guest today, Marty Claus, and we're getting ready for Mardi Gras. Welcome, Marty. Yay, my time of the year. <laughs> it is a fun time of the year, and we uh, are, we're really interested in finding out about some of the history behind what you do with your group. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to New Orleans? Well, originally, I'm an artist. I'm from Portland, Oregon. I went to school in Eugene. I lived in Seattle. I lived in Arizona lived in California, kind of all over, but I had a big fascination as a kid with skeletons, obviously from um, drawing bodies and things like that, because part of the study is the human anatomy. Um, but I kind of took it a little further, and I actually ended up in my yearbook as a skeleton with my three girlfriends as the four horsemen. People kept thinking we were Grateful Dead, and I'm like, no, I'm not a hippie. I'm into the skeleton. I would think the black and white would have been a clue. Yeah, it wasn't so colorful. Um, and I was like working in a record store, music store, and into my like dark metal and things like that, and like goth. And so, you know, and then I started booking shows up in Seattle. So, of course, skeleton, always, always had my skeleton rings on. And, and somewhere down the line, I was venturing out with my girlfriend, Karen, who had moved to New Orleans. And uh, my dad had died in, I think it was like back in the 90s, early 90s when my dad died. And I was very depressed. Um, that's when I saw uh, one of the Mexican stores in Seattle had the Day of the Dead figurines, which of course I was fascinated with. So I had to go home and try my paper mache skills, which I did. Of course um, you did. Of course. You know, and then I come down here finally for a vacation and I did what the typical person does, except I didn't move here then. I fell in love with Mardi Gras. And I just looked around and I saw the Arthur Hardy guide and the art in there and the floats. And I was like, wow, what a great fantasy to move down here and paint floats and be involved in all this and sell art and how colorful and, you know, all of that. And uh, so I think I came down here two years in a row. Wait, no, I skipped one year. Because uh, of 9-11, and I came back after I'd moved to Arizona. And then I was going through divorce, and I was like, you know what? If I'd never married you, I'd already be there. And I just up and moved here. Excellent reason to come to New Orleans. Get rid of all the bad trash. <laughs> yeah. Leave it behind. And I got here, and a friend of mine, Debo, who I really didn't know, but she was writing me letters, let me stay with her until I found a place which is also typically NOLA. Cause, I was just going to say, that is know. so typical New Orleans. We are like the couch surfing capital of the world. Yeah, and like I was at the parades that year, and I would go to the – I asked the officer, where would you go if you, with your family? He goes, I go to where they end because that's where everybody's dumping stuff. And there's nobody down there, like down by Mule Lots. And I'm like, okay. So I go down by Mule Lots, and here's this woman, and she's all dressed up crazy, and she's catching stuff, and she keeps handing it to me. And then the next night, I went to a different end of the parade, and here she is again. And then on the third day, when I bumped into her, I go, I guess we were supposed to meet each other, and that's how I met her. And, of course, we ended up at her house partying for one of the uptown parades. And, you know, she started writing me letters. I was getting calendars, the Huli calendar she would send to me every year. So I was fascinated with it. So when the divorce came, see you, buddy. I'm on my way to New Orleans. It's a pretty seductive place, too, that 
for oh, an yes. artist in particular, the opportunity to use all the different influences that we have here in the city and to see all the visual splendor that's really here. We forget how close we are to the Caribbean and to the European countries in terms of what we do to celebrate holidays. So you took that experience, you came to New Orleans, you turned it around. What happened next? How did you get into Skins and Bones? Well, it's interesting. I was um, at Ambalo back before it became the Healing Center, and I was an artist there. And I had some of my paper mache skeleton rattles with me and some art. And this this crazy Indian wild man came up to me and said, I really need one of those for my suit. And that's how wild man John, who is now Big Chief Ellis, that's how he and I met. And he actually followed up on me. So I would go to a bunch of his shows and I ended up doing like a skeleton every year for his suit out of paper mache that he'd put on his staff. And I ended up going out on Mardi Gras Day with him and Queen Yolanda. And I noticed he didn't have any drummers. And he said, yeah, the Wild Chop Tullers are kind of quiet right now, but we still come out. And I went through the whole thing. I carried his flag. What a great experience that was. That was like stepping away from the commercial uptown parades to see something in a neighborhood. And that's when I saw my first Indian, I mean, my first skeleton. And I thought, what's going on there? Mm -hmm. And uh, he got me out to St. Joseph's Night after that. And I saw them sweeping up the streets afterwards. And I'm like, what is that? And he explained it to me. And then um, I was working at the Hi Ho. And John Hartsock owned it at the time and convinced me that you know, because I said to John, what if you had a whole bunch of women behind you drumming? And he's like, that would be awesome. <laughs> and so we joked about it all summer. And my husband said, you guys could be called skins and bones, skins for the drums and bones because you're bones. And he's like, Claudia, you've always been a bone. So, so John talked me into it. And, uh, I remember being a little upset with John from the Heart Sock because he said it was skull and bone. I said, you don't want to say that because that's not who we are. And so I had to make him change. He did the ad on purpose like that a couple of times, and I was mortified. But all these women showed up, and some baby dolls showed up, and quite a few people showed up. And John was there. And not everybody had drums. We all had, like, tambourines. But we did Little Liza Jane. And if you didn't have your stanza, we had to skip you. We'd go to the next person, but we weren't going to finish, according to John, until everybody has their stanza. Oh, my goodness. So How long were you there? 30 times at least around. And finally, the one person who couldn't get it right, I'm like, you know, you could sing like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Just here as I long am. as it's the rhythm. Yeah, we're, here we are at the bar, you know, you just just come up with something. It doesn't have to rhyme. And it was more of a fear thing, I think, than anything. But we finally did it. And here we are, like almost 10 years later, and we're much different than we were then. Um, but it's been a wonderful experience. So for our listeners who haven't ever seen you guys out, because I see you every year in the parade for Joan of Arc. I see you on the street. I've run into you all over. You're in Krampus, which is so cool. Uh, and I see you guys when you're doing other stuff, but not everybody does. So why don't you tell us what exactly Skins and Bones is now? What we are now is I, we are a woman's bone gang. We are a women's drum corps. Um, we actually did a Viking wedding on Halloween this year. That was really fun. Uh, the gentlemen in my crew, I call them soul sweepers from after seeing the bones sweep up the souls after St. Joseph's night. My soul sweepers are more like a security for us. Several of them do drum. Um, we do come out on Mardi Gras morning, but we put a female element on it uh, as opposed to the traditional one here. We do come out to wake people up. Um, this year we'll be out with lots of fireworks because we like firecrackers. Um, and we do our little procession in usually the St. Rock neighborhood. Uh, we'll be in Femme Fatale. We do muses. We do uh, the April Fool's Day Parade where I got to ride a horse. That was really oh, fun. That's an excitement. I've done that a couple times now. Um, we've done Merci for the Magic. We've done the Anne Rice Ball. We're going to be doing Ship Rocked, which is uh, January 31st in the quarter for a jam cruise ship group of people. And they wanted us to lead their voodoo parade because they like us 
and had seen us as Dr. John themed for Cruel Boo. Very cool. That is very cool. I think it's interesting too to to realize that there's a very large spiritual element to the Bones Gangs traditionally in New Orleans. And you have pulled in with your group these influences from other countries in the drum chants and some of the music that you brought in. Tell us a little bit about some of the influences to the drumming that you've brought into the group. Well, I think we typically try to stick with New Orleans music, like we do John Cleary's Boneyard, simply mm -hmm. because it works. Um, we did the Dia de los Muertos with the crew of Mahuel this year, which I've waited for a Hispanic group to pick that up in this town. I think they're the ones who should be leading that brigade. And they did it the first year, and we stepped back because I didn't want people to confuse us with them. I wanted them to have their limelight. And once they got the limelight, then we stepped in, and we've kind of paired up together, and I have a lot of respect for them. They did the Frida and Diego theme in Crude Illusion last right, year. Right, I saw it last year. They were beautiful. beautiful. And we got to do Gretna Fest with them. Cieto Lindo and all these kind of different songs, and we just kind of play back and forth. But I'd say my greatest influence here, most likely, especially since I went to the Dia de los Muertos in Mexico, is the Hispanic version of all that. Um, and with my dad's passing, I think it's really important you should respect your elders and you should know who you are. You should know in the end that we're all we're all bone again at the end. Very true. And uh, I think one of the greatest things Skins and Bones ever did was we went to the Women's March in D.C. as skeletons, which brings up the question from people, why are you dressed like that? Well, and if they couldn't figure that out, hopefully they know better now. Yeah, I couldn't believe the amount of people that came up to us and we didn't bring our drums because they said, you know, you couldn't bring certain things. But once we got there, we realized we could have. But we had our chants and we had our tambourines and stuff. And that crowd was not moving. There were so many people there. But if we started chanting, people would get out of our way. It's like, oh, here they come again. Oh, look, there they are again. So that was a lot of fun. There's one thing you have to get over when you're in New Orleans. You cannot be bashful or timid. It's no. just not allowed. So in addition to doing your music for Mardi Gras, you also, well, of course, you do it all year long, but you also do the art. So tell us a little bit about where we can find your art and the website for your group. Well, the funny part about the art is um, – I went through Hurricane Katrina here, which kind of bonded me to this city. And my husband's Puerto Rican and Polish. And here we are, the phone lines are down, and it's 7 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, and somebody's pounding on my house, and I go out in the backyard. And this is when I lived on St. Rock, and I'm like, what are you doing? And it was a Hispanic worker, and he goes, I'm fixing your phone lines. I'm like, at 7 in the morning? He goes, ma'am... You have no idea how many houses I need to repair. So I just do them as I do them. And, you know, and I'm like, well, thank you. And so I turned to Kim and he said, you know, Claudia, you need to make that skeleton as popular as Roderick's blue dog. <laughs> you know why? And I said, why? And he goes, because all the streets in the city are Spanish, were named by the Spanish, and they're back to fix their city to reclaim it. And if you were to marry that into the second line, which is already actually here on its own, you might find yourself in a whole world of showing all kinds of skeleton art everywhere. So my first painting after Katrina was a skeleton blowing on a saxophone water over the city with flames in the background. And boom, there I'm back to painting again. Excellent. I've I did seen that. that one. I love that one. Yeah, I did the hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil with Reagan, Riley, and Jordan and all the crime scenes. And so I've got, they do political stuff, but most people don't get to see it because, you know, I do show at Surrey's and we're not going to show those kind of things while you're eating lunch right? or breakfast. Um, I've shown at the Crescent City Ballroom, uh, the XO Gallery Skull Club. Uh, Crescent City Brew House. I love to do that spot. Um, I've done the artists, and I kind of move around. Right now, I like doing the festivals. Um, I took my website down. I didn't think it was getting enough traffic, so you can always find me on Fine Art America, Marty Claw, M A R D I C L A W, or through Skins and Bones, which is S K I N Z N B O N E Z dot com. I am on Facebook for a little while longer. Kind of grown tired of the. 
I don't know. It started out as a good thing. I think there's so many angry people there now, you know? Well, there are so many people in New Orleans who enjoy seeing your art in person and the Skins and Bones gang as you guys perform. And one of our guests later in the episode today is uh, a Mardi Gras Indian himself, Big Chief Juan Pardo. And he has written a story where the Bones gang is the evil sort of scary thing he's using with his little brother in the story. And they find out, of course, that the Bones gang is not that evil persona. It's, it's a great, it's a great thing. It's a great thing. Yes. Yeah, it's sweeping the city, taking you to task for your, for your deeds. And, uh, the political satire is definitely a part of it. Well, you know, I did a portrait of, cause Juan and, uh, wild man, John or big chief Ellis are pretty good friends. They yes, perform yes, together. They John actually has the portrait of him and Juan. I did a long time ago at his house. And I've actually done portraits of Big Chief Sun Pie, but I gave those to Ronald Lewis at the House of Dance and Feathers because mm -hmm. if he really wants a scoop, you got to go see the gatekeeper, right. Ronald. Right. We had a book a few years ago, uh, Spy Boy and the 96 Crayons, and the author of that one went and Rob Owens and sat with him for, I, I think, almost a year on the porch as he was teaching some of the young kids beating and talking and listening to the stories before he got approval to write a story. Right. He's definitely not in that community. So right. So it, it is very important to that. And I think that's one thing that comes through with the Skins and Bones is definitely a respect for the traditions of the city. I have three things I ask of my crew. One is called Bone 101, where we all talk to each other and we call it in, we don't call it out. Number two is a visit to see Ronald Lewis, the gatekeeper. Um, at at House of Dance and Feathers and take a look at what's down there. Ask him the important questions. And, of course, you have to take a picture with him or I won't believe you've been there. Right. And I actually just bumped into Ronald like a couple nights ago at Vaughn's, so that was a lot of fun. You know, and then the third thing is um, don't talk about things. That, if you don't understand what's going on, ask questions. Don't assume that you know the answer to them. It's a very, fi it's a very fine line in the culture line here where it turns from um, – being uneducated and coming out dressed like that, as opposed to being educated about it, being respectful. Um, I do not allow feathers or, or anything like that, Mardi Gras Indian oriented in my crew because we're not Indians. Mm -hmm. um, and Danny still goes out with uh, the original wild Chapatulas, so that's still happening. And so it's a nice crossover. And I know we've had one with us one time for Crude Illusion, or I think it was six to nine. And um, I always like to go see Juan play with uh, Honey and John on Bacchus Sunday. That's always fun at Le Bon Ton. Yeah, he's so, so talented. We were excited when he came to us with this book. We hope we have more with him. So we're going to be talking with him later. So what's the last thing you want to leave us with about you and Skins and Bones and the upcoming Mardi Gras season? We're very excited. Of course, Joan's right around the corner. Um we're going to do something that we've never done before for Crew Bohem, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. What? Other than to say you need to come out and see us in Crew Bohem, and then try to, and then you'll 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 get it when you see us. It's, What's the date for that parade? I believe it's February 6th. It's the Friday night before Crew de Vu, and this will be their second. Uh, oh, I think it's role. actually February 7th. Or 7th, yeah. It's the okay, same 7th. night as the Joan of Arc opera premieres. All right. Well, thanks for being on our show today. Uh, we will look for you around town in the next few weeks in Mardi Gras and, of course, throughout the year. And once again, the website is S-K-I-N-Z-N-B-O-N-E-Z dot -E com. Yes. And thank you, Juan, for putting this out. Yeah. What a great book. Way down the bayou. Tell y'all something that you don't know. Way down the bayou. My spy boy coming in a P-roll boat. In just a moment, we'll be joined by Big Chief Juan Pardo of the Golden Comanches and hear all about his new book. I have with me today author Juan Pardo. We're talking about his new book, When the Morning Comes, and his background with the Golden Comanches and the Mardi Gras Indian tribe. Welcome, Juan. Thank you. Thank you. 
So the first thing we all want to know about is tell us about your background with the Golden Comanches, and it was your older brother who was the big chief first. How'd you get into this tradition? Um, I grew up in it. I've, it's just like New Orleans. It's been here just just as long almost. And um, my brother was the original chief of this tribe, which he was a spy boy for the Golden Arrow tribe. His chief was a uh, we called him Big Chief Pepe Eugene Esteban, and that tribe was started by uh, an elder chief long ago, uh, known as Big Chief Rabi. But nevertheless, um, over the years, my brother, being a spy boy, was um, given the opportunity, and it was passed down to him to become a chief. Mm-hmm. And at the time, that blessing was coming from the chief of the Golden Arrow tribe, and so that it would remain culturally significant without changing that tribe. We brought in the name, the kinship of Golden from Golden Arrow, and we became Golden Comanche. And so that started that chapter uh, of the Golden Comanche tribe under my brother and then being passed on to myself. That's such a cool tradition in New Orleans. Now, what neighborhoods are are sort of your area? Um, Jackson and Dryas is pretty much like the cross streets where where the tribe started from mm-hmm. in, in its origin. Uh, first in Willow, mm-hmm. also uptown. And right now, I would say Louisiana and Liberty, where the Sandpiper Lounge is off of uh, Louisiana Avenue. Oh, that's a nice area. Yes, uh, yes. Always interesting over there. The lounge is pretty nice. They have music there. Do you Now, you're a musician as well. Yes. So where do you play? Everywhere. <laughs> I've seen you overseas, too. Yes, I mean, yes. You've been from, out of the country uh, playing. Yes, from uh, Paris to Bordeaux, uh, Perigou, Paraguay, depending on who's saying it. Um, New Orleans, Colorado, you name it. I've pretty much been there and heading back. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the kind of music that you play. The music we play is uh, what we call engine funk. In short, but it's uh it's the tribal sounds, the tribal drums, uh, mm-hmm. mixed infused with a funk, a guitar funk sound of the of I would say kind of of the seventies, um, and that style of music was started um when Willie Turpinson, which was had at the time had a band called the Gators, and um, Quint Davis had the idea of putting them on stage with the Wild Magnolias at one of the very first, uh, at that time, the jazz festival was called the Tulane Jazz Festival. Mm-hmm. And so they uh, performed together and just to kind of see what was happening with that. And it, it created this sound uh, in, the, in the early 70s that has become you know, a world-renowned sound that is now known as engine funk. So uh, that's that's what it is. It's the tribal music of the Mardi Gras Indian culture infused with electric instruments in this great dance that we call Indian funk. And it definitely gets you moving. That it does. That, that's the nice thing about it. So maybe we need to get you to do your next book on uh, a little bit of that history. Hey, I'm up for it. So let's talk about this book. Uh, the cover is so distinctive. We It's got a, a great illustrator, but they took a photo of you in your full costume yes. and turned it into an illustration. Um, tell me a little bit about the beading and stuff that you do on there, because it's just amazing. That particular suit um, is—it's amazing that uh, that was the suit that was chosen to uh, to be a part of the illustration process. That suit was worn worn by me also in the HBO series Treme. Oh, so wow. I had I had two suits in that in uh, during the filming of that when that was happening here in New Orleans, and that particular red suit was used uh, in it. And uh, it has the depiction of the Native Americans with horses. Mm -hmm. And if you were to Google or do your research on the Comanche Indian tribes, they were the first horse trainers. Mm -hmm. And so on that suit, it has a three-dimensional horse in the center. And uh, it shows them in the process of breaking horses and and in that training process. And that that suit was significant to me because I wanted to uh, express what the... Uh, Comanche tribes of of the U.S. worlds about and and what they what they were most known for as far as records uh, history historical records goes uh, as is written and um, the reason that the Comanches is important is because uh, my grandfather when he traveled uh, here to the U.S. he came through Comanche territories so uh, that's an important part of my history there but that suit is. Um, 
the color is uh, to pay homage to the Mardi Gras Indian prayer, Indian red that we mm-hmm. sing at the beginning of any uh, function or gathering that we do uh, in the culture. And we also sing it at the end as a prayer in, in starting and a prayer as you go in blessing. So it's kind of like leave with a blessing and Indian red serves as that, as that blessing, that song. Yeah, the the end papers of the book are red. We matched it to the image, so right. I thought that was a nice touch too. So yes. you start with the red and you end with the red. Yes, pretty cool. So tell us about the story, because this is such an exciting time of year for you yes. and for the Mardi Gras Indians and for the city as a whole with all of these parades. Of course, the Joan of Arc parade and the Fun right. of Forty Fellows started this week, and yes. we're looking forward to uh, the next series. So tell us a little bit about the book and the storyline. The book is about Jason and Max, and it's the little brother, big brother, sibling rivalry thing. Uh Uh-oh. And so it's a play on an actual event that happened in my house. My older son was kind of messing with his younger brother uh, when he was very little and and kind of figuring out what was going on in the house with the suits and all. And... uh, before he could totally understand everything that I was saying, his brother thought it would be a good joke to make him think that Mardi Gras morning would be this very scary <laughs> event. <laughs> and throughout the story, he, he explains the culture to him in a very unique way that only a big brother could do to a little brother uh, without giving it away. Yeah, and, we don't want to give away too yeah. much. And so... Um, at, let's just say it kind of ends with a, a different twist. Um, but the story is, is definitely is something that is relatable to a real event within the culture. And it also gives people a window into the culture in a very sneaky manner because it, it's educating you about how the culture functions and operates. Right. But it it's not reading like a history book, so it sneaks up on you. But you're actually learning things about the culture like very important things and and i think it brings the culture to people in a way that simplifies it from a kid and Mm -hmm. i've even found that adults especially those that know the culture they've i've gotten people that tell me they totally get it like they were like what better way to do this and um outside of that story uh as far as that part goes another important reason that i did this is because um when kids are brought to us sometimes on Mardi Gras day, mm-hmm. we can be intimidating. Yeah, you guys are pretty. Yes. It, it is a little startling. I've come up on a street and uh, met a tribe and just been like, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it can be a bit much, especially Beautiful, for the, yeah, but, but uh, a bit much for the little ones because, uh, you know, for an adult to walk up, you know, it's a little different. But when you're that little, that low to the ground and there's these towering suits and these right. guys, and especially with that energy, you know, depending on when they oh, see yeah, us. Oh, yeah, the drums and everything. Yes. It's great. And so uh, I had a few instances where kids were brought to come to me to take a picture, mm-hmm. but they were frightened. Right. And so from seeing this more than one time, I was like, what if they had the opportunity to understand this culture Mm -hmm. and meet us in a different setting? Right. Where they so that when they did see us on a Mardi Gras day, they would have a better understanding of what they're seeing. And it wouldn't be so intimidating It'd be more approachable. So I thought that having this book, being able to reach the kids and uh to use it as a way to get into the schools and to be able to interact with kids. Like one of the most important things that I wanted to happen with this book is not for it to just be purchased on the shelf, but for me to do as many story times Mm -hmm. or uh, go to as many schools and do readings where I bring tribe members and we bring the book to life as I read it. So I wanted the book to be an experience. So this this was more than I didn't want this to just be that book that went on the shelf. This was an opportunity to really reach children and educate them and make this culture approachable to them. Right. So that that's that's really the whole reasoning behind this. This is more like a, an invitation to the children, to the culture. That's that's the way I look at it. It's, it's such a great way to present it in a book, too. I know uh, you're probably going to be at Melba's Wash World coming up very soon. Yes. And she's going to be giving away the books there, and that's going to be a great opportunity. So watch on uh, the websites to see those dates if you're listening. 
but you have some signings coming up too. Yes. At Barnes and Noble on February first in Metairie. Yep. And then at Barnes and Noble on the West Bank the following weekend, where they can actually come meet you. Yes. Are you, are you going to be reading at those events, or is yes, it more like I'm a- gonna uh, I'm gonna do readings mm-hmm. and. The idea I'm pushing to have to be able to bring the story to life there at Barnes and Noble, too. So for those who are listening, um, you might want to come out because we will probably be bringing When the Morning Comes to Life. In, <laughs> a little in bit the of store. a surprise in yes. there. A little lanyard for your day. Now, you have uh, also sort of a, a project. You know, you talked about bringing this to life and bringing it into the public, but a good portion of your mission, both with your music and with your um, the the things that you do with the Golden Comanches is bringing this education to the yes. community and talking about the traditions and the culture. Talk a little bit about what are, what are those important things to you? It, it's very important in within the communities because it's a very community based uh, culture. First mm-hmm. off, and due to the situation that we're in here in New Orleans right now, with so much going on. Um, it, although it may not seem on the surface because of the commercialization of a lot of things, but uh, some of this can be lost right. in the hustle and bustle. And so uh, it is important to me that people experience this through literacy because mm-hmm. that was something that was instilled in me very young. Uh, my mother was definitely a person who wanted me to uh, experience life through literature. Because she came from a time period where that was how you experienced most things, by by reading about them. And, right. and that's how you made your choices. And so a lot of the things that I read stuck with me. So I was like, this would give me an opportunity to hopefully, when you, it's like studying for a test in school. The more you study, you retain that information, but it's written down. Certain things on television may go by because you're not studying it. But something that you read, you tend it tends to stick with you a little more. Uh, something about turning that page still, you know, for paper books. Yeah, We're all about paper books. Exactly. You know, it, it's it's just it's something about it. Uh, and so that allows me to, I guess, sink sink into people's mindset uh, a little more from especially with the kids. And it's important that the reading aspect of this, because uh, sometimes kids don't want to read what mm-hmm. is put in front of them as far as a curriculum in school, but something that catches their attention, that's a little more colorful, a little more exciting, then that you may get their attention. So I wanted to also be able to kind of break down the literacy barriers for, for a lot of children, especially in challenged communities where uh, it may be a little harder to get the attention, maybe a little harder to keep the concentration. So I think the energy and the vibrance of the the, the culture can capture those those kids that may be a little more challenged to to stay in tune with the literacy part of it. I think that's very true. I mean, you've got you see it on the street, and then you get to read about it, or you right. find out that there's a book, and it's like, wow, someone knows what's happening in my life. Right. That's such a great way to look at it, especially since you mentioned that it happened with your own kids. Right. Yes. I have two younger brothers, and uh, I definitely would say <laughs> that I'd do the same thing to them. It's like, exactly. Oh. Well, we talked with Marty Claus a little bit uh, in the early part of the episode, and one of the things that she mentioned was the House of Skins and Feathers and Ronald Lewis and his attempts to keep the traditions alive, too. And I know that you work the night with them, yeah. too. Yeah. So one of the things that you're doing to bring in this next generation, you've got this great book that kind of introduces it, and you have your own children. Are they in the – do they uh, mask as well? Yes, yes. They have been masking since they were little. Um, right now, my oldest, he's really into, you know, this New Orleans. He's a uh, saxophone. Oh. So that's that's really where his he's, his energy is right now. And uh, they know of what they need to know in the culture, but I also um, allow them space. Mm-hmm. Because this, this is a dedication that requires a lot of time and, and effort. And so... Um, they they choose when they want to build a suit and, and, and partake in it, but they always are with me helping out in, in those different things. They just kind of pick the years that they actually want to make a right. suit. <laughs> you know, as they get older, they decide that maybe it's more cool than right. thought. Yeah, exactly. 
as I see the accolades and everything, the attention in in the last ten years or so, mm-hmm. especially since Treme, because right. you you were such a big part of that show, showing that culture in right. the city. Um, and then I think it was an opportunity for the rest of the world to see these amazing, talented artists that right. do this street art all the time. This is not unusual. You have events all year long. Yes. So I think this book is going to be wonderful. And once again, this is When the Morning Comes. It's a Mardi Gras Indian story written by Big Chief Juan Pardo. And it is available now in the bookstores. And you need to come out and see him at Barnes & Noble on February 1st in Metairie. And at Barnes & Noble on the West Bank the following weekend. And then watch for more events coming up. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. All right. Happy Mardi Gras, everybody. Big Chief. Thank you for listening to the Pelican Pod. We release new episodes every two weeks on YouTube and SoundCloud. If you'd like to read these books and more, visit your local indie bookstore or find them online. The Pelican Pod is brought to you by Pelican Publishing, an imprint of Arcadia Publishing. Recorded and produced by James May. 